Welcome to Deep Weird Dialogues with me, Dr. Jack Hunter. In fact, this is going to be a deep weird monologue where I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I mean by the concept of deep weird. But in the episodes that follow, I'm going to be talking to contributors to this recent book, Deep Weird, The Varieties of High Strangeness Experience. And I'll be talking to contributors about their chapters and some of the ideas that they explore in them. Okay, so what do I mean by the concept of deep weird? I tend to use it in two different ways, really. In one sense, I want to sort of come back to the old Anglo-Saxon conception of the weird as a deep structure of reality that links together a disparate phenomena. So the Anglo-Saxons used to have this concept of the weird that was a sort of connecting principle in a similar way to the way that Jung used the concept of synchronicity, something that connected events um, deep down, deep in the levels, you know, deep levels of reality. And the other way that I try to use the word deep weird is to refer to a way of thinking about the weird and the paranormal. Not just a surface, shallow approach to the paranormal, but to think deeply about it. To avoid reductionism and to try to embrace its full complexity. And complexity is really one of the main themes that arises in this book. Thinking about paranormal experiences, not in terms of reductionism and trying to explain them away with one particular theory, but trying to explore them from as many different perspectives as possible, and also trying to take into account the weird interconnections that seem to bind them together. So there's been a tendency in academic research on the paranormal to try to approach it from a reductionist perspective. We can see this in parapsychology, for example, where paranormal experiences are taken into the laboratory and tested with statistical methods, when in fact the way that these experiences occur in the natural world is very spontaneous and often very emotional. Okay, so these experiences as they occur in the real world are actually quite wild, and it would be very difficult to bring them into the lab. So what parapsychologists find in the lab are very small kinds of statistical effects that really pale in comparison to the extraordinary experiences that people have in the real world. So this book is really saying that we need to take those extraordinary experiences seriously, the experiences that people have in the flux of their everyday lives, in the flux of all of the different kinds of social and cultural phenomena that are going around them, as well as the ecological dimension which I think also needs to be taken into consideration. But when we do start to take real-world paranormal experiences seriously, we have to come face-to-face with a whole range and variety of different kinds of experiences that seem to defy any kind of academic attempt to rationalise them or put them into neat compartments. So, for example, what we might call poltergeist phenomena often occur alongside Bigfoot experiences. UFOs are often seen at the same time as Bigfoot. We have all sorts of different kinds of telepathic and other uh, psi experiences occurring in and amongst these much stranger experiences. So while the academy has tended to focus on psi effects, small effects, or experiences that are deemed to be sort of respectable, like religious experiences, for example, it's tended to ignore these much stranger, much more outlandish kinds of experiences, which are actually reported surprisingly frequently. Um, So one possibility has been suggested for why this takes place. Uh, The psychical researcher René Haynes coined this great concept of the boggle threshold, which is the point at which a researcher says, no, I'm not taking that, I'm not accepting that any further, it's too weird. Okay, so what I'm saying is that we need to sort of lower our boggle thresholds a little bit and take all of these strange experiences into consideration. And when we do that, we can start to look for parallels or patterns across experiences. And we see that there are striking similarities even between some of the most outrageous, what might be called high strangeness experiences, and some of the most widely accepted transpersonal religious experiences. So, for example, the experience described by the theologian Rudolf Otto of the Numinous, which he split into two discrete parts. On the one hand, he said... The numinous consists of the mysterium fascinans, which is the beautiful, fascinating element of the mystery of the mysterious and paranormal that draws us in. And on the other hand, we've got the mysterium tremendum, the awe-inspiring and fear-inducing element of supernatural experience. Okay, so we actually find this this uh, feeling response, Otto called it, amongst all sorts of different experiences, right the way from 
uh, religious ecstatic experiences all the way through to encounters with, for example, the men in black or weird humanoid experiences. So again, we have this idea that there is something that connects all of these disparate experiences together. This is not to say that they are all the same thing, but actually that we're dealing with um, variety and diversity as well as connection and unity. So that's about it for my short monologue, but I hope that you'll join me for future episodes where I'll be talking to contributors to Deep Weird, and I hope you might also check out the book. Thanks. <laughs>